Good evening, everybody. This is Jason Akers with Green Acres Pest Control, and I'm starting early for once. I haven't been here. I know last week I was sick, and tonight I thought I'd come on a few minutes early because I, uh, I feel bad for missing everybody <laughs> over the last few few weeks. I've been really sick. I've had a cold. Uh, it's been really bad year this year for sickness and things, so I've uh, it seems like every time I do a live stream, I'm sick. So, but tonight we're going to start early and I'm going to try to touch base with a, a couple things I've had some uh, issues with over the past uh, uh, few weeks. Some questions that have come up and some things that have happened and I thought I would address it live. I was actually considering making a few videos about it, but uh, I thought I'd go ahead and come on live tonight and I'll talk about it with everybody. So, um... I've had a few questions, and I just lost my chat window. All right. Um, I've had a few questions that come up about uh, heat treatments. Now, I know I've got a lot of videos on my channel, like three or four of them dedicated just to heat treatments. I know I've done a couple of things on my uh, live stream talking about heat treatments, and I know a lot of people know that I am not for heat treatments. But um, tonight I'm going to explain why uh, heat treatments are not the best idea for bed bug control. And the main reason, I had a, uh, a customer, a customer, not really a customer, a, uh, a contact that actually watches me on YouTube. He um, called me up. He lives in North Carolina and he was asking a few questions about heat treatments. And he, I, the reason that he called to ask me about heat treatments is because um, uh, a company local to him, actually one city over from where he lives, uh, actually burned a house down doing a heat treatment. And I was asked not to, develop, to, not to tell you the name of the company, but the, as far as what I can tell you is it was a very big name company. And they actually burned a house to the ground uh, doing a poor heat treatment. Um, I am a member of several face groups, like face group groups, whatever, Facebook groups, and they uh, actually, they talk a lot about uh, heat treatments in this group. And one guy actually asked a question. He posed the question to the members of the group. He said, have you ever, and this is an other exterminator, have you ever uh, done damage to someone's home doing a heat treatment. And one response I thought was really good was, if you haven't done damage to a home, then you're not doing your heat treatment properly. That was the actual comeback to his question. And all with all seriousness. And several other people had commented and said that um, they have melted vinyl windows, the tracks, from the, a heat treatment is done, they got these big ducts, like really big round ductwork, that they run through your windows. And uh, if they run the heat from outside, and they use fans to kind of divert the heat throughout the house, and this allows for the living space to in, to you know reach the top heating quality to kill the bed bugs. But the problem is the heat source has to be the hottest where the furnace actually is. It's actually blowing the heat through the house. And so the heat builds up, it gets really, really, really hot around your window where that ductwork goes in over your vinyl windows. And it can actually melt the track that the window seats to. And you have to typically, uh, exterminators require that you sign a waiver in order to do these heat treatments. So if any damage does occur, you they are under no obligation. You can't sue them. You can't require them to pay for damages. And this is something that they agree to beforehand before they will even do the heat treatment. You have to sign a waiver allowing them to do this. So I know that this is a big deal because you want to kill bed bugs. You don't want to burn your house down. And so I just thought I would go over that a little bit. I have a couple of other things, just it's bit, bits and pieces that I'd like to talk to tonight. Talk about, talk with you, my uh, subs and everybody who comes and watches my, my YouTube uh, tonight. Also... If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I uh, 
You know, I answer any questions via Twitter. Um, you can ask me on my Facebook page, which is Green Acres Pest Control on Facebook. Uh, if you don't want anybody to know your name, I don't ever divulge people's names. They either call me on the phone or they, uh, you know, contact me through Facebook. I never tell people what your name is unless you want me to. Um, so just so you know, if there's any, uh, you know, any questions that you want me to uh, discuss on the air live, you can always ask those questions on uh, Facebook if you don't want people to know your name. Uh, you can ask anything you want live in the chat. Um, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to answer any questions you have. It doesn't have to be about bed bugs. I know the name of the show is a bed bug show, but you can ask, ask any questions, uh, whether it's about ants or uh, bees or, you know, lots of things start up now because we're coming up into spring. People are still getting mice in the house. Um, actually, I wanted to go over that tonight. I had a customer I went to today, actually on a Saturday. I don't usually work weekends. I'm 24-7, but... Uh, you know, I don't typically get calls over the weekend, but I did have a lady that called me today. She had mice in the house and a competitor had gone in. And this is one thing I wanted to address. I thought I might actually make a separate episode altogether and go over this on, uh, maybe include a mouse Monday episode on one of my mouse Monday videos. But, um, they were using glue boards. Now, this is something I've, I can't, I've never used glue boards for mouse control. And I'll explain why. A lot of exterminators love to use glue boards. Now, from those that don't understand what a glue board is, it's basically, it's a piece of white poster board, kind of. It's got glue kind of, you know, stuck all over it. And they'll typically fold it up into like a little box. And they'll sit those down beside your washer and dryer, uh, underneath kitchen sink, uh, basically places that the mice like to roam in hopes that they'll go in the glue board, get stuck, and they'll die there. And then the exterminator will come back and they'll take that glue board and they'll throw it away um, with the, the dead mouse and everything on it. Uh, one of the main reasons I don't like to use glue boards for mice is because the... All right. In Virginia, in central Virginia, where I'm located, um, we have such drastic temperatures that the mice are in a constant state of shedding. If you have house pets, dogs and cats, and they live indoors, you'll know they always shed. You're always trying to clean up your hair. You're always having to sweep it up. It gets all over the place, especially in the changing of the seasons, typically from fall to winter and from spring to summer. And so mice are the exact same ways. They're animals, and, they, and they're living inside your house. So they they shed just like animals do. They shed their winter coat. They shed their uh, their summer coat, getting in, in, in preparation for winter. Um, that's normal. And so what will happen when you put down a glue board in someone's house? The mouse will run over the glue board. It will pull the hair off their body, and they'll just keep running across it. And it will actually, the glue boards will get covered in hair. I should have taken a picture of the glue board I saw today. It had hair all over it, where the mice had been walking back and forth and back and forth. It wasn't catching the mouse, but it was pulling the hair off their body. Uh, that's really typical of a glue board. Um, one reason I don't like to use glue boards, not only that, because they can walk right, to, right across them and it won't really catch them, um, is because when it does catch them, they will go to an extreme to get off. Uh, they will chew their feet off. I've actually found glue boards with pieces of mouse body parts on the glue board where the mouse has actually chewed their foot and left their foot behind and walked off the glue board. Um, personally, I know I'm an exterminator. I kill bugs. I kill mice. I kill squirrels. I kill all kinds of varmints that get in the house. I do trapping as well. So a lot of that, the most humane way is to kill the animal once you catch it. In fact, in Virginia, you have to. You really don't have an option. Catch and release or you kill what you catch. And um, so personally, I feel that a glue board and, and this is going to sound bleeding heart or whatever, but I don't care. Uh, I feel that glue boards are just inhumane. Um, I have witnessed mice when they get caught on a glue board. They will actually give birth. Um, if they're pregnant, they'll start to deliver babies on the glue board. And then you've got this mouse and you've got all these little babies coming out, you know, 10, 15 babies all over the glue board, screaming and squeaking and squawking and making all kinds of racket. And imagine this. Now, you're an exterminator. You go in somebody's house. Your job is to kill their mice. That's what they hired you to do. You go in there. You put down glue boards. And then the customer has to come behind you. And they have to deal with 
dead animals on a glue board, or worse, live animals on a glue board that they're already scared of, they don't like, and they're laying there squealing and squawking and screaming because they can't get off the glue board, and they're stuck there, and they're going to die there. There's not really anything you can do to get them off. You can run if you, I, this is one thing you can do. If you find a mouse on a glue board, you can put acetone on the glue. It will loosen the glue and the mouse can run away. So if for some reason that your exterminator has put a glue board down, you don't want to kill the mouse, you could take the mouse outside and you can run acetone over the glue board. The mouse will jump off the glue board and run away. I don't usually recommend that because mice are covered in diseases and urine and feces and all kinds of nasty stuff that come with having mice in your house and you don't want to come in contact with them. But if you don't want to kill them, you can do that. Uh, of course, the mouse is just going to get back in your house. You know, the mouse got in your house in the first place. So it's not really ideal. You typically do want to kill the mouse that you catch, um, which is which is which uh, goes on to my second uh, point, is that your custom, what I was saying earlier is that your customer just doesn't, they're not paying to mess with mice. They're paying you to mess with mice. So when you use a glue board in someone's house to catch mice, that's not what they want. That's not what they're paying you to do. And so that's why I don't personally do glue boards. I mean, if you do, all power to you. If they work for you, that's great. They may work better in other states, like out in Arizona, where it's mostly arid and you don't really have a lot of temperature difference, maybe in California. But in central Virginia, we have very fluctuating temperatures. For example, last week it was uh, in the 30s, and this week it was in the 70s. So you, you've got that, and then next week it's supposed to be in the 50s and 60s. So you've got that constant roller coaster of temperatures, and when the temperatures do that, the mice are constantly in and out of the house, in and out of the house. They don't actually enter a pure state of hibernation like they would in northern states, like up around the Dakotas or maybe Minnesota, where it's still winter right now. Um, the mice actually go into a, a hibernative state, and they'll sleep through the winter. But here in Virginia, I just don't recommend glue boards. I don't think they're very successful. Also, um, if, if you're really concerned, you could always do traps. You could try to trap mice or rats. Um, the problem with trapping rats, though, is they're pretty smart, and a lot of times they just won't go in a trap. They're very difficult to catch in a trap. In fact, one of the most successful ways I've seen people that have actually been able to catch rats in traps is they will uh, put them in, like in houses that only have one mode of entry, whether in or out. Um, they'll put the trap there, and if the rat has no other option but to run over the trap, they'll catch them that way. Um, especially roof rats where they're climbing rafters. A lot of times you can set your traps on the rafters themselves, and you can catch uh, the rats that way, kill them that way. So um, I just don't, I don't usually recommend trapping. I don't usually recommend glue boards. Uh, baiting typically works the best uh, depending on what type of bait you use. Now I do recommend baits and I do have that on my, uh, on my actual Mouse Monday series. I've got, I think it's like third episode, second or third episode where I actually go into baiting for mice and rats and I go over a really, really successful bait. So if you're really interested um, later when this video goes live, I'll actually link that in the description below. And you can go check out that video or that uh, playlist. I recommend that you do if you're having problems with mice. I know mice are a problem this time of year, at least in Virginia, and probably all over because of the changes in the season. Um, they will be a problem now. Uh, not much more for the next couple months or so. But, you know, once a mouse gets in the house, they start living in your house. They're perfectly happy living in your house. So um, it was one other thing I wanted to go over that, oh, I saw a video. Now, it was a really interesting video. Uh, in fact, if I can find it, let me see. I've got a little bit of a different setup today. So let me see if I can search out this. I actually think I saw it on my Facebook. Um, and just so you know, guys, anybody that has any questions at all, you're welcome to ask anything. Um, let me see. What is my password? I can't even remember. Uh, aha, there we go. Alrighty. Let me see here. There was a woman that actually 
you may have seen this. This video has been kind of floating around Facebook lately. Of uh, a lady that up oh, there it is. Let me go ahead and I want to mute this so it's not loud. Oh boy, there we go. Let's close that. All right. Let me see if this will work. Whoa, that's really big. Um, hmm. is that? Oh, wow. That's really huge. Okay. Alright, so let's go ahead and grab that. The woman who kept the bee as a pet. Now I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Now I'm not going to play the music or anything like that. But this is on Facebook. You can find this. That is a carpenter bee. Pretty sure. Oh, it says it's a bumblebee queen. Maybe it is... You know, let's go ahead and see, because I don't necessarily know if... I don't think that's a bumblebee queen. I'm pretty sure that that is a carpenter bee, because bumblebees are quite a bit smaller. Let's see. Um, all right, so the whole reason I wanted to show this video is carpenter bees are very docile. This is a carpenter bee. And this is why I thought for sure, whoops, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Well, there's a picture of a bee anyway. Let's go ahead and show you that one. That's fine. All right. Um, scroll down. All right, now what carpenter bees, now this is the time, it's time right now for carpenter bees. This is when they're in season. Um, they're going to start reproducing. Now what carpenter bees do, is they, I've got one or two videos on this on my channel, but what they do is they bore the wood of your home. They're really bad in log homes. They're bad in the uh, cedar. A lot of times log homes will have cedar soffits, and carpenter bees love to bore into your cedar soffits, and they lay their eggs there. Now, carpenter bees, in the spring, they mate. They lay their eggs in the wood where they drill. So it's a half inch hole. They drill a perfectly round half inch hole. They turn 90 degrees and they drill with the grain of the wood and they make little galleries off of that one major tunnel that they make in the wood. And in, the, in those galleries, excuse me, they lay eggs. And those eggs, a couple months later, hatch out and they become carpenter bee larvae. And then they eventually pupate and they become full grown carpenter bees to return next year in the spring to, to do everything all over again. So sometimes when you have carpenter bees, if they've been causing a problem in your home year after year after year, um, then usually it's several generations that you're going through that have been living in the same house, drilling in the same house, boring in the same house, and they can make lots of holes and do lots of damage. Um, while she was showing that they're basically harmless uh, because the queen had lost her wings, she couldn't fly, she couldn't get away, um, which... That's one thing about carpenter bees a lot of people don't know about is that they, uh, the queen is the one that lays the eggs always. And carpenter bees don't, they don't have a hive like uh, honeybees. So they will actually, they bore into the wood, they lay their eggs. Every queen is individual. Every queen has their own eggs. They lay their eggs. They don't hive. They don't have a hive mentality. So they don't group together. They don't, you know, the males will protect the queens, but they don't have a stinger. So you can actually take the wings off and they won't hurt you. They won't actually be able to hurt you. A lot of people worry a lot about carpenter bees, and they do call them bumblebees. They're not bumblebees. They're carpenter bees. The reason I say this is because bumblebees will actually sting you. They do have stingers. They can sting you, much like a honeybee will. But uh, they're actually not too aggressive either. I've, I've never been stung by a bumblebee. I've dealt with bumblebee hives. I've never been stung by them before, where I have been stung by honeybees. And you're not going to get stung by a carpenter bee. Uh, I've actually held carpenter bees in my hand. I have swatted them with my hand. When they get in your face, they get right in your face. And I've swatted them away. They won't hurt you. Um, you could take the, like I said, if the wings were to fall off of a bumblebee, they could crawl all over you. They're not going to do any damage to you at all. So it's not anything to worry about. But they do lots and lots and lots of damage. Let me see if I can find...
carpenter bead damage. Let's see if we could find some some pretty extensive damage. Now that's what I was I like like that right there. That's a good a really good example of the type of damage that carpenter bees do. You see how they will they drill a hole and they'll actually um, make those little galleries like that. Now a lot of times what will happen and Aaron says, let's see what Aaron says, because he's the first person that said something. Uh, not all bumblebees can sting. The males don't have stingers. Correct. Um, now, is this with bum Now, let me ask you something, Aaron. Now, you're talking about bumblebees, or are you talking about carpenter bees? Because I know, here, let me move my, let me actually move this down here. There we go. Because um, I know that carpenter bees won't sting you at all, even the females won't sting you. But, uh, Anyhow, the females are what do, do the damage. They're the ones that do all the boring. They're the ones that are doing this stuff to your deck rails. They're doing this, uh, you know, this is this is carpenter bee damage over here. This is actually a, a really good image of the hole that they make, like that perfectly round little hole right there. That's, that's a really good example if you see that in your wood. A lot of times you won't see these galleries. Now, I'll tell you what will happen a lot of times after carpenter bees lay their eggs in the wood. Woodpeckers, because you see this wood, this, this house here is in the woods. A lot of times the woodpeckers will come down and they'll peck that line out and you won't know, you won't see but just this one little hole. And then give it two or three months after the larvae have hatched, woodpeckers will come and they will peck that whole line of damage right there and pull that larva out. But they'll do all that damage because what a woodpecker does is they'll peck, 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 peck the wood. And when they hear a hollow spot, they'll just tear that wood all up and trying to get to ants or bees or whatever happens to be living in there, whether it's termites or whatever to try to eat those bugs that are in those holes. And so that's actually what does most of that damage is, is uh, woodpeckers that come behind trying to get to those bee larvae. Bumblebees, the females sting and will first bounce off of you as a warning. Yeah, but see, like I said, Aaron, I've never been stung by bumblebees. I've, I've, I've never been stung by carpenter bees. But carpenter bees, see, a lot of people will, carpenter bees are about an inch and a half long. They're huge. They're very, very large bees. Where bumblebees are quite a bit smaller. They're like half the size of a carpenter bee. And so, um, yeah, like I was saying, the, the bumblebees aren't very aggressive. Carpenter bees are more aggressive than bumblebees, but they don't even sting you. The males are the ones that will get right in your face and hover like that. And they won't even sting you at all. They don't have stingers. So, But the females, the females have a stinger. What she does with her stinger with carpenter bees, is they sting like spiders, crickets, and other bugs and stuff. And they'll take them in much like uh, trench bees and uh, dirt dauber wasps. They use their stinger to paralyze bugs that they seal up inside the uh, cavity of the wood that they've drilled out. They seal those bugs up in there so that when the, it just paralyzes the bug, it doesn't actually kill it, so that when the bee hatches out of its egg, it can eat that bug, get the nutrients it needs in order to pupate and become a, a new carpenter bee. So a lot of times when you see this, this stuff like this, you'll actually see like dead spiders and stuff inside these galleries where they have eaten these dead, these dead bugs. So um, understand that's what they're doing. They're trying to reproduce and they're leaving uh, their young in there with food. And you can get rid of carpenter bees. They're not actually that hard to get rid of. You can dust the holes. There are, there are dusts made for carpenter bees. There are liquid sprays you can use for carpenter bees that are very effective. And uh, you can treat those holes. Typically, this is the time of year you want to do it. As soon as you notice carpenter bee activity, you want to make sure you treat the holes on uh, do-it-yourselfers. You know, people that are having problems with carpenter bees continuing to be a problem, they, uh, you can treat in the spring and you can treat in the fall. Most of the time when I do a carpenter bee job, I actually like to advise people just a springtime spray is typically all you need. It's very hard to catch carpenter bees in the hatch cycle because depending on how long it takes for them to actually pupate after they... All right, so what they do is they, 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 they hatch out of their egg, they pupate, and then when they come out, they, they, when they transform into a new bee... It's hard to catch when they're at because because the hatch cycle is going to be different for per bee, um, based on how old they get. Now I don't know maybe they don't pupate. Let me make sure because I may be getting this confused. Um, well, 
multiply cycle. Let's see. Yeah, see, those are the grubs. Now, I, did you see that all the time? The grubs. Let's just make sure. I don't want to give anybody bad information. You know what? We're doing an image search. Let's go to all information. Carpenter bees are large, solitary creatures. They get their name from their interesting nesting habits. Females of Yeah, egg, larva, pupa, adult. That's right. That's what I thought. Right there. Okay, so basically what they do, they pupate, and much like a caterpillar, and that cycle depends on when it was laid, what stage they're in, if they're ready to, to become an adult or not. And so do-it-yourselfers are going to be able to attack those hatching. Uh, I say hatch, but when they come out of the pupa stage, you're, you're going to be able to catch them because you're going to be able to see them. You'll know when they're active because you live there. You live in your home, and you're going to know when they're active. An exterminator, it's really hard for an exterminator to judge when it's time to spray the second time around, when you want to actually treat in the fall. So it's easier for you to treat in the spring, uh, do a really good thorough job in the spring. Uh, there are some pesticides that will actually last all the way through all the stages from egg larva pupa to adult and will kill the adults when they hatch. Not very many chemicals will last that long. And so it's better to just treat in the spring. And if you catch it at the springtime, every beginning of the season, then usually after a couple years, you don't have any more carpenter bees. I've actually been able to eliminate carpenter bees in log homes where the homes were completely infested with carpenter bees, where they just kept coming year after year after year after year. Um, it took me about two years uh, with one treatment per year in the spring and you, I mean, you're always going to get your residual bees that will try to come and and find a new home. Like they're 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 new bees. They're coming to a new place, trying to find a place to lay eggs. There's always that risk. But I have actually been able to eliminate carpenter bees by doing it that way, just treating in the spring once a year for two to three years in a row, and then the carpenter bees are basically non-existent. Now there's always a chance that new bees will come in once you eliminate those generations. There's always a chance that new carpenter bees will come in and, re and re try to reinfest. And so you have to keep your eye on that if you start noticing them. And also, if you have a lot of flowering bushes near the house, there's a, I can't even remember what the name of that bush is, but there's a, I think it's rhododendron, um, that carpenter bees really like. They pollinate those. I've noticed a lot of people with log homes love to plant those big flowering bushes, uh, butterfly bushes. They'll, I don't know if they're called butterfly bushes, but I know they attract butterflies. They also attract carpenter bees. And if you plant those right next to the house and the carpenter bees coming there to pollinate those plants, they're going to recognize, they're going to say, oh, I can lay my eggs here. I'm just going to go right up into this soffit. I'm going to start drilling on this person's house. And so if you really want, if you're having problems with carpenter bees continuing to return to your house, you might ought to think about relocating some of your bushes. You know, flowering bushes are typically not the best idea if you have like a log home and you don't want carpenter bees, wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, you know, things like that that are actually attracted to your home. Maybe you don't have problems with carpenter bees, but yellow jackets like flowers too. And they'll come and they'll start, you know, I'll tell you another thing, yellow jackets like boxwoods too. And so, you know, if you've got those things planted like right next to your door where you're walking down past the bushes constantly in and out of your house, you're probably going to get stung a few times because you've got bushes that are attractive to the bees sitting there. So just keep that in mind. Um, I think that's really all I really wanted to go over. I think I've addressed just about everything I wanted to today. Um, if there's any questions, don't hesitate. I'm not really sure because my how many people are here tonight. Um, because my chat, my, uh, my live stream window got closed on me. And rather than open a new one, I've just been kind of sitting here talking, so I'm not exactly sure how many people are here. Usually, if there's a fair number, um, I'll stick around for a little while and see if there's any questions at all in the chat. I know there was a, a guy that actually called me a couple days ago that wanted to know when I was going to be live. I know I've been early tonight. I, I was about uh, 15 minutes early tonight, mainly because I've, I've, uh, I haven't been able to upload any videos. What kind of dust do you use? Uh, Alpine dust is really good for, for bees. Um, that's what I've had the most success with. There are other dusts out there, 
that are labeled for bees, but Alpine Dust is really good. It's, it's really, really successful for bees. It's really good for yellow jackets as well. If you're having problems with yellow jackets, um, it's really good for that too. And you just have to dust the hull and uh, the bee will travel through it and it will kill the bee. But you have to be careful with Alpine because uh, it is a neonicotinoid, so you need to be very careful where you apply it, that it doesn't drift down on any flowering bushes or anything like that. And I, oh no, what is this? You know, I'm, I'm not going to post, I'm, I, I should show everybody this picture. Because my wife just sent me a picture. All right, let me let me tell you something that happened. I've discovered Snapchat. That is just a hilarious program. And you can take some of the funniest pictures of yourself. I'm sitting here. I'm trying to be serious. I'm trying to talk about my live stream. And my wife sends me one of the goofiest looking pictures from the bedroom. <sighs> and that threw me way off course. And I forgot all completely everything I was talking about. Which is probably her. That was her mission. But, um. But anyway, yeah, the uh, you need to be careful with alpine dust because you don't want it to land or drift down onto any flowering bushes. You want to make sure it all stays in the holes because it is a neonicotinoid, and you don't want to uh, accidentally. Because a lot of one thing about bumblebees and carpenter bees is, or carpenter bees especially, because that's what we're talking about, is carpenter bees will um, they communicate a lot with one another, and so with the neonicotinoids they'll spread. And you just want to make sure it doesn't fall down on any flowering bushes. A lot of the exact same flowering bushes that carpenter bees pollinate, honeybees pollinate too. And you don't want to infest, you don't want to accidentally poison car, uh, honeybees because they will go back and it will poison their hive and it will kill the, the honeybees. So uh, it's a very particular how you treat with it. Just follow the label and make sure you're following your label right. But um, alpine dust is really good for bees, if, just to answer your question. And now she's sending me something else. Let me see here. This is going to be another picture. I just know it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're sending me all kinds of pictures. My, my wife and my daughter. So now they're wearing flower crowns. So And they're laughing about it in there. So, <laughs> But anyway, like I was saying, I'm really sorry about the lack of videos on my channel here lately. I've been, uh, I said I've been really sick, and I just haven't had a lot of time to do videos. I've been really, really busy. And... Uh, I do have a lot of videos in my, you know, in my mind that I've been thinking about doing, and I'd like to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, a couple live streams back, I did go over uh, pregnancy and pesticides and how you have to be careful around pregnant women and uh, if you have a fear of uh, pesticides around you when you're pregnant, uh, what you should tell your exterminator, uh, what you should allow in your home. I really want to go more in depth because I think that's something that people really need to know about, and so I'm I'm going to go over that. Uh, I've got a couple other things in the works. Like I, I want to go over a little more in depth of carpenter bees behavior, uh, mouse behavior with glue boards and things like that, and why you don't want to use glue boards for mice. Um, why it's important to pick a really quality bait for mice because uh, palatability is very important when baiting for mice. So there's a lot of ideas I've got floating around in my head, and I do have a brand new BNG that I ordered uh, that hasn't been used. For those that don't know what a BNG is, it's an actual uh, one gallon stainless steel tank that a lot of exterminators use and so I've got one of those that I want to actually show people how to apply pesticides when using a spray tank so that's something that I put got work uh, worked out to where I'm going to do with a fresh the reason I want to use a fresh tank that's never been used before is I can put some water in it and I can just spray water rather than use something that's already had pesticide in it I really don't want to do that and so I want to show people how to spray um and be you know I don't typically when I do how-to videos I'm doing it in my own home, and I don't want to just spray a bunch of pesticide all over the place um, when I'm trying to teach you the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. So I want to show that. I'm got, I've got a brand new tank. I want to show you how to do that. So uh, hopefully that in the next couple weeks, I'll have lots of content for everybody. Like I said, I'm really sorry I've been so busy. And like I said, I had, I'm still suffering from a head cold. The um, All of the trees came to bloom all at once. And I think this year is going to be pretty bad. In fact, my head, it feels like that's just being squeezed in a vice right now because the, uh, the the allergies are just awful this year. So usually springtime allergies don't bother me. I tend to get worse allergies in the fall. But uh, when they're cutting the hay and, and all that typically does bother me pretty bad. But hopefully things will get better and I'll be able to get more videos out to you guys uh, at a better 
better quality rate because I hate to not give you content and just be, you know, reliant on these live streams like this because I just feel like a live stream is just not as quality content that you get with uh, actual videos that you can go back through and you can watch and you can rewind, fast forward and stuff like that. Um, people don't want to just sit through, a, you know, an hour long video of somebody talking about all kinds of different stuff like tonight. Went over bed bugs, we went over mice, and we went over uh, bumblebees, so or carpenter bees. And so anyway, hopefully I'll be able to get you guys some some better videos out there. If there's any questions, uh, go ahead and shoot them to me real quick, um, or I'm gonna uh, head on off of here and and give me a little bite to eat. I haven't really had dinner tonight. I hadn't had a chance. We've been out in town a lot lately, so I hadn't uh, we hadn't been here. But um, anyway, I wanted to let you know. I did open a Patreon. Uh, I've I've started doing um, now. What I do use my Patreon for? I uh, Patreon is a service that you can basically you pledge like so much money a month or whatever. It goes to me. Um, what I actually do with that account is I take that money and I put it towards people that have bed bugs that need bed bug treatments that can't afford bed bug treatments for themselves. Um, uh, just so you know, I do the same thing with YouTube. Everything that I get from the monetization of my videos, I take all the money and I put it towards uh, needy families that can't afford bed bug treatments because the bed bugs have been so bad and they're so expensive to deal with that a lot of people just can't afford it. And so people that fall into the lower income uh, bracket, I do take the, uh, I take the um, income that I get from Patreon. And I do have a Patreon that actually it ticks over tomorrow. Um, and his name, it, I'll tell you what, tomorrow I'll put up a video and thanking him personally, but, uh, cause I said I would, but, um, anyway, cause tomorrow's the first, the way Patreon works is it only ticks over on the first. So once the first ticks over, I'm going to start, uh, doing a credits on my show and I'm going to thank my patrons at the end of my show. So, um, I really appreciate everybody and all your help and, uh, you know, I know that it's just Virginia is the only place I can legally treat, but, you know, it does go to a good cause. I do take everything, everything. I don't keep any any of it. All of it goes into a separate account that I use to help people uh, treat their homes because it is expensive. The chemicals I use because I use Crossfire, it's one of the most expensive chemicals available for uh, bed bug treatments. And that's what I use because that's what I've had the most success with. So um, also, if you uh, like I said, if you have any questions ever that you want to ask me ever. Uh, you're more than happy to send me any questions at all over on Facebook. I try to get back to people within, you know, the first 10 minutes I receive a message. If not, it's usually within an hour. Uh, always that day, I try to get back to people. I have people message me from all over the world, and I don't mind answering your questions. I also have a uh, website, greenacrespc.com. You can, uh, you know, hit the contact button there, and you can send me an email if you want. It's actually, you know, you got a lot more characters you can use there. So you can send me a, a letter if you need to. Uh, describing your problem, and I will try to get, uh, if I can't answer it on a live stream, if it's not something that's going to take more time, then I'll actually take and uh, do a video specifically for your question, if you have any questions at all. So, um, also, I've got a Twitter. You can send me bugs, you know, if you want me to identify a bug. You, I've got, you know, hashtag bed bug show. You can, I will um, answer your, uh, you know, I can identify bugs, positively identify bugs for you. And that's at Green Acres PC is my Twitter. So you guys have a really great night. I appreciate everybody uh, hanging out with me and uh, putting up with the fact that I haven't been putting very many videos out lately. But hopefully that's going to change. I just hit 1,400 subs today, which is great. You guys are, are wonderful. If you if you like the live streams and you want to catch my videos when I put them up, um, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. You guys have a really great day. I'll see you later.